Be sure you pick up a study guide. Uh, it should read Angelic Conflict 2. We're in Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Of course, we've read it so much, we probably don't need to read it, but here's how it goes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, tohu wabohu, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Something occurred, and when you have Genesis 1-1, you have an earth ready to be inhabited. When you get to verse 2, you have an earth that's uninhabitable. What happened between verse 1 and 2 that had to be restored in verse 3? So we, we studied seven doctrines that fill that gap between verse 1 and 2 of Genesis. We studied the doctrine of the Eternal Life Conference, in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, like in 1 Peter 1.20, before the foundation of the world or creation, there was an eternal life conference held. At that eternal life conference, the plan of God, secondly, the plan of God was laid out. Uh, for not only the heavens, but the earth and whoever dwelt on it. So we studied that. We studied how did darkness that covered verse 2 become the darkness of the world that man is redeemed from? Like in Colossians 1, 13, you are born in the domain of darkness. Satan controls how that domain, dominion operates. That's Colossians 1.13. In order to get out of that domain and to get into the domain of light, the kingdom of the beloved Son of Jesus Christ, you have to believe that he died for your sins, buried and raised from the dead. He's got to go to the cross and do the finished work for sin, he's got to be buried, and he's got to be raised from the dead. You say, how is that possible? It is because of the sin of Adam that required two deaths of Christ on the cross. God told Adam and Eve, in Genesis 2.17, not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat it, dying you will die. Now when we get to the second chapter sometime next year, at the rate I'm going, we'll actually study it. But in the Hebrew language, he talked about two deaths. When Christ died under the cross, he died two deaths. He died a spiritual death first for the sins of the world, physically. He had to bear the sins of the world while he was still physically alive. When that was finished, he said, it is finished, the Thaleestai, and he gave up his spirit. He, he physically died. He died spiritually while he was still alive, and then he died physically. His body went to the grave. His soul went to Sheol for three days and three nights, and he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. That last death on the cross is what is involved in the burial and is the importance of the resurrection. As a result of that, when you die, you go to be with the Lord. You go up. You don't go down. And that's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we studied that. We studied uh, the fall of Satan in eternity past. We did it out of Revelation that shows you the 12th chapter, how 
what his final day will be. We saw his first bad day, and we'll see his last bad day when he's cast into the lake of fire in Revelation 20. So we studied that. We studied tohu wabohu in verse 2 that says that the earth was in such a condition it could be uninhabited based on Isaiah 45, 18. So we studied that. We studied the creation of the abyss, where the fallen angels of Genesis 6, when they tried to revolt the earth on earth against the plan of God, you had the Noah's flood. And those angels were put into the abyss in the heart of the earth. You say, I've never heard that. I know, because you don't go to a Bible teaching church. Do you learn it here? I've already taught this. Now, you say, how could I catch up with all of this stuff? Well, you can go to our website with John Dyer. You can go to our website, Doctoral Studies. You can pick up all these studies. We, we, they're up on the line. You just go in there for under the series 2022 study of Genesis. All right? So we've done seven studies between verse 1 and verse 2 because it's important. You know, how did the earth become uninhabitable to in, inhabitable, uninhabitable to inhabitable in verse 3? Then when we get to the creation story, you want to remember, here's what people miss. They, six days of creation. What did God do on the seventh day? Rested from what? Creation. So what did he create in six days that made the earth inhabitable? We're going to talk about that. Remember that the first three days deal with the darkness of verse 2, and the last days deal, last three days deal with the water. And what is done, the earth is inhabitable. We, and we will study that. But, you know, sometimes you, you read, read the Bible and then don't read it. You read the Bible and don't study it, <laughs> is what I meant to say. You should study it. I encourage you to study the Bible. You could learn this stuff. I'm sent because I want you to find the joy of the scriptures, and the joy of the scriptures is to find out what, they're, what they mean. Right? You want to know what they mean. So, so we're done. So today, so our, the last study we did in the gap was... Um, angelic conflict. We did one session on that. This is our second session on the angelic conflict. That was Satan's revolt against the plan of God in, in eternity past. Now it's on the earth because Satan has been cast out to the earth. That's his domain. A play, that's his playground. And it will be such until the end of human history. Okay? And so I want to talk about a few points today with my time left. Remember, we will start verse 3 next week. We're going to look at the six days of creation and the day of rest. We'll talk about six days of creation through verse 31 of chapter 1. All right? So I've, I've brought that to your attention. I also put on your paper Acts, the second chapter 23, which when you read this, I'm going to tell you what it means. Here's what it says. I wrote it on your paper. This man, talking about Jesus Christ, was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. What is the predetermined plan of God? Well, that's the Eternal Life Conference, where the plan of God was laid out. What is foreknowledge? That's omniscience of God. Foreknowledge is a word that comes down to you and I, foreknowledge, foreknowledge, knowledge that is beforehand that you can learn. And so it, it, it gives you a, a human terminology and anthropopathism 
to kind of help understand the omniscience of God. Well, Ron, the omniscience of God, how does that work? Well, Paul says it works by the predetermined foreknowledge of God. That Jesus Christ came into the world, died on a cross by the predetermined, by the predetermined foreknowledge. You nailed to a cross by that Jesus Christ, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. That's Peter's sermon at Pentecost. And he uses these kind of terms. Last week, in our study of the angelic conflict called Part One, uh, which covered eternity past, we're now talking about that on earth. And that, that, angelic conflict that occurred in eternity past between Satan and God and the angels, the war of the angels between the elect and the fallen business has now come to earth. It's now on earth. And this angelic conflict that I'm going to talk about today is on earth and it's in real time and will last to the second coming and the end of human history. <clears throat> Revelation 20.10 says, then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. That's out of the tribulation. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That will fulfill Matthew 25, 41 and the judgment of Satan that occurred in eternity past. Okay? You should read Luke, the 10th chapter, verse 18. When Jesus said, I saw, I saw Satan fall. You need to have that experience. This week, we're going to look at these four aspects. Point number one, following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Satan turned his demonic warfare against the church of Jesus Christ. Today, the angelic conflict is against the church of Jesus Christ. In the world, when Christ comes back the second time, there's going to be a rapture when the church is going to be caught up to be with him. I'm not talking about brick and mortar. Of course, I'm talking about human beings. Those who are redeemed of the Lord. Ephesians, look at the book of Ephesians. Always remember, you can find it quick, quickly by going to the front of your Bible where it tells you Ephesians and gives you a page number. All right, so you can find it like anywhere else. Go to contact, contents. Here we are in the sixth chapter as we close out the book. Paul writing, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having gird your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to able to distinguish, extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Finally, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, let me show you that. Let me break this down to you and show you how you should study something like this. Okay? Just a simple study. This is how you break it down. I took S words, I took the S words out. For example, to be strong in warfare. Two, stand against the scheme of the warfare. Three, spiritual equipment of warfare. Okay, let me show you. One, two, three, four. I put the, I broke that passage down into four parts. I put it on your scripture to show you how to study. He tells us that the warfare is on whether you like it or not. Agreed? <laughs> it's, 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 it's going. And listen, you're on one side or the other. You're never neutral. Okay. You're never neutral. So he tells you, you need to be strong in warfare. Right? He says, be strong. Right? right. Be strong. Now watch. He tells you how to be strong, though. You say, what does that mean, Ron? What does it mean to be strong? Well, he tells you. Watch what he says. In the strength of his might. In your strength? You're going you're gonna to fight, fight and win in your strength? 
In your power? Mm -mm. Whose? In the Lord's. He's already fought that war. He's always won that war. You've got to fight the schemes of the devil. You have to fight in the angelic conflict of evil forces. You have to fight it. You have to fight it. You've got to be strong. Jackie's report is talking about people who are in, in it up to their eyebrows. They're in it over their heads. And you know what they're learning? They're learning how to be strong in the Lord. What does that mean practically, though? Watch this now. It means in the strength. You know what strength is? Let, let, Willie, you go to the gym. Guy wants to be strong. So he goes to the gym, and he, he picks up the, the, the dumbbell. The dumbbell. And he starts working out. And you go like, well, that might be all right. Let's, let's put five on the end of it, though. Because what you're looking to see how strong he is and how strong he can become. Because he didn't know. He just walked into jail, picked up one of these dumbbells. And that's an interesting title in itself, isn't it? But he doesn't know how strong he is right now. So you just keep putting weight on until he can do five, right? Or something like that. And you go like, okay, that, that, that's, a, pick it up so you can do five. I can't do six. That's good. That's, that's your strength. We're going to charge you. We're going to do that for the next three months. We're going to charge you, and you will be amazed. Now, what are, you, what are you trying to do? Trying to get him strong, but to do it, you've got to build up his what? His strength. Do you understand that? In the angelic conflict... The more you go to what you want to, what he wants you to be in the strength of his might, he builds you up. You understand? Be strong. How are you going to be strong? Well, you, you, you do this, you do this, what well, he's going to tell you every day. Listen, the devil is up before you get up. <laughs> and he's up after you go to bed. But this dude never sleeps. All right? He's got no reason to. So you got your hands full every day. And so how are you gonna how are you gonna fight the good fight of faith? How are you gonna do it? Not in your strength, in your own power. Listen, you don't know how strong you are until you get tested. Agree? So part of the angelic conflict is to test you how strong you are for battle, right? Competition is what brings us out. When everybody gets strong enough to play, play the game, then, you know, then it's a matter of contest of who is the stronger in the game and who is the smartest and the, who's got the best schemes and all that. Now watch this. Your goal is to be what? Strong. How are you going to get there? You're going you're gonna to go to the gym every day, not whine and cry. You, and you're not going to lift more than you can bear, right? But you're going to be able to do more than you did yesterday or than you did last week. Because what? Your strength is making you stronger. Now, where does this strength come from? Where does this strength come from in the angelic warfare? His power. You do it in His might. That's omnipotence. That's omnipotence. Uh, the omnipotence of God feeds your life strength to be strong in the angelic conflict. Right? That's because you have the Holy Spirit living in you already. You have to tap into the source. You've got to go to the gym. You've got you to lift the dumbbell. All right? This is an exercise. Watch that now. That's the first thing I saw. That's the first thing I saw in verse 10. In verse 11, I saw in verse 11, I should put on the full armor of God. Why? So that tells me why. 
so that you will be able to stand firm. He's going to tell you what that means in a little bit. Against the schemes of the devil. I'm standing firm against the schemes of the devil. That's his strategy against you. Listen, the devil has strategy against every believer because we're all different. We have different strength levels. And every strength level you get to, he's going to test it. The schemes are strategies against you. Football players, basketball players, coaches, all that, they all have strategies. The people that don't get beat. All right? So we've got to do what? We've got to stand firm. How do we, how do we stand firm? We stand fi f firm on faith. Right? We stand firm on faith. Stand firm in a warfare. What are, why, why is that important? Because we're to put on the full armor of God. We're put to put the full armor of God on and stand firm that you may be able to stand firm. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against. Remember the devil already every day he comes out as strategy. Look, look. Go study the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2, and you see the devil has schemes against you, a believer. And he comes up with his scheme. He says, I want to, I want to test Job. And he has a strategy. And the Lord lets him only go so far with his strategy, and then he, he goes no further than that. You understand? He's always got a strategy. No matter how many times he comes up there. Now, he only come up two times with Job. But listen, he's got a lot of strategies against you. You don't have any against him because you don't study the Bible. But you should have strategies against him. You know, two guys who play good strategy, it's going to be quite a ball game. Okay. All right. Now watch his struggle in verse 12. Watch the struggle. Our struggle, our struggle, our struggle is not against this, it's against this. What is the struggle not against? What is, your, what is your warfare every day not against? Flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's not against visible. It's against the invisible. This is an invisible warfare. You'll know when it shows up because it's all about evil. It's not good. It's evil. Won't be good. So we have a struggle. It's okay. But just remember your struggle is not against what? It's not against flesh and blood. You spend most of your time fighting with people and losing in the angelic conflict. No matter how many fights you win in the flesh, you lose in the angelic conflict. It's a distraction. Quit that stuff. We need you on our team. Now watch what it watch the invisible war that goes on that you should be fighting against. Rulers, this is his this is Satan's military strategy against us. Rulers, rankings, you know, just like in the army, you have, you know, you have the generals and the colonels, and the, you know, down you go to a private. There are powers. There are powers. There are all different kinds of strategies, like we have. We fight from the sea, the land, the air, right? We sing about it. Powers. World forces of darkness. That's, is that, you know where that darkness comes from? Genesis 2-2. Two, two. That Genesis 1-2, this is his darkness. Uh, spiritual forces of wickedness, spiritual forces. You know what this is? This is like, the, for the Navy, this is the Navy SEALs. The, the, these, these are the, listen, how do you know it? Because I read how the chief the heads of the spiritual forces that attacked Genesis 6 through 9, his name is Apollon in the Bible. 
in the book of Revelation. We studied that. And we study a lot of things if you come. Spiritual force and wickedness. And now we have the spiritual equipment. Spiritual equipment to fight the warfare. Watch this. You have three things you wear and three weapons. You have three things to wear and three weapons. Watch this now. I'm in verses now 13 through 17. Watch this now. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Now he's going to explain. So that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Three things you wear. Right? Three things you wear. This is the, the wearing part of it. And here are the weapons parts of it. In addition, take up the shield of faith, which will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles, arrows, missiles in our day, of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Do you see that? Six pieces of equipment. But listen, th three are closed, and three are weapons. Three we wear, three we fight with, weapons. Okay? You need, listen, here's what, you're, here's what you need to fight every day. You need truth. Because what, what, what are you fighting against? What's the opposite of truth? Thank you. And who is the greatest liar in the whole world? In fact, he's called that. Satan. John 8, 44, he's a liar, liar, pants on fire, big guy. <laughs> right? He's the guy. All right? So you, every day you've got to have truth because you're, every day you're fighting lies. I mean, turn to television on, you'll know what I'm talking about. Right? The breastplate of righteousness. What's the opposite of righteousness? Unrighteousness. Right? Unrighteousness. And the Bible tells you that's not good. It's, you don't live the unrighteous life. You live the righteous life. You know, you do what God tells you to do. You study the word, and when he tells you, and they, listen, you got to know what dispensation you live in. You don't live in the Jewish age. They're Jews, but it's not their age. We live in the church age. You've got to know the doctrines for the church age. What, what does it mean to be righteous? You've got to follow the New Testament, the New Testament teachings on what righteousness is. Because the devil tries to get us into unrighteousness, and God wants us into righteousness. I'll teach you all this if you stay around. And you've got to have your feet shod with what? Nah, you're missing part of it. Give me the whole, it's a, listen, you can't just pick up a weapon in the army. You got to know what that weapon, what that, what that weapon is called. We got different Bibles. No, no. <laughs> Look. Watch this. Shod your feet with the preparation I mean, you take it with H, why can't you take it with G? I know, it'll come later, it'll come after lunch. It's the preparation, the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that possibly mean? It means you got to be on your toes. All the opportunities are yours to be prepared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings peace to the person who is out of, out of kilters with God. You have to have preparation. You've got to be prepared. When you go to the grocery store for a loaf of bread, what does that mean? Well, it means I just went to get a loaf of bread. Listen, here's what this means. Go prepare to share the gospel with somebody. 
You don't just go to the gym to lift weights if it's, if it's Willie's gym. I guarantee he's going to give you warm weights. He's going to tell you how to get the burdens off your soul. It's true with all of us. We go prepared. That when God shows up with somebody, we can share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the preparation of the gospel of peace. And listen, carry a, a list with you of people that need Christ. And you go, when I don't know, when you, listen, when you, your mind goes blank, put it in prayer. Reach in your pocket and pull on that prayer list and pray for that person. It, it, it may not just be salvation. It may be marital problems. It may be children problems. It could be business problems. Pull it out and pray for those people. Well, in addition, taking up the shield of faith, the shield of faith, watch this, look, look, look what faith can do to you, the shield of faith. What's the shield? The shield, that be able to, because the Satan's on the attack, what, what's he throwing at you? You know what the shields were made of? What do you think shields were made of in the old day? Stuff that could burn. Whatever could burn, right? Flaming arrows. Whatever, whatever, you, whatever it was, Satan thought that he could fire flaming arrows. Today, we call that missiles. To destroy whatever your shield is, right? And listen, he always moves his strategy on it. Listen, this is the idea of powers. You know, uh, Putin says, you know, he, he, he goes the nuke button on you all the time. If he thinks that you're getting a little bold on him, he said, well, I might go nuke on you. Right? What's he talking about? He's talking about different power systems of attack. I mean, he, he tried his tanks. He tried his military. I mean, this little, this little farmer's baiting him. And every time he gets pushed back, what's he doing? Well, I'll go to the nuke. What's he doing? He's just rattling. Listen, he's just, it's, it, it's, it's propaganda. Don't you understand that? Well, he's got him. Well, who hasn't? Uh, and who doesn't have him? We shouldn't let him have him, right? I mean, I sometimes wonder if we ought to have him. I don't know. Point number two, and that we'll get out of here in a minute. <laughs> what are you supposed to put on? How much? How about all of it? Well, what are you supposed to put on armor? How much? He said, put on the, all of it, right? Full. The full armor of God. Some of it we'll wear, some of we we'll fight with, right? It's all, it's all good equipment. Now, this, this is how you win. This is how you become strong in the Lord. You go out there and you fight him. Can you beat him every day? Absolutely. Right? Did David get Goliath? Got him good, got him big time, didn't he? You know how he got him? With the power of God. You know how he got there? He had to kill a bear and a lion. Same way he killed Goliath, he killed a bear and a lion. Same way. Same MOS. See? You can get him every day. Same MOS. You get him, you can get him every day. You never you never have to be defeated. But he's gonna be on your door. He'd been waiting on you to get up. What are you sleeping? Come on, get up. I got to slap somebody around today. Might as well be you. Don't let him do that to you. I mean, you got him beat. You got him beat. He has to keep changing his names. He's got more names than, than Jesus got. Yeah, every time he's just, he's slick. He just pulls out a different name. Well, I'm the deceiver today. Oh, I was looking for the guy in the big red suit with the. <laughs> Well, he's, I'd take him off the shelf. Hey, we don't we use him anymore. Both the fall of Satan, watch this now. Both the fall of Satan and the fall of Adam teach the importance of God's grace gift of the freedom of volition. We call that free will. People, I don't believe in free will. Well, you ought to. Do you have a cell phone? Well, why do you need a cell phone if you don't believe in volition? You know, we used to call it a wristwatch. If you, well, anyhow, it don't matter. And it stirred up a hornet's nest. The fall of Satan, watch this, 
Ezekiel 28, where, where they talk about it, listen to what he says. Because you have made your heart, this is God's judgment on him, because you have made your heart like the heart of God. You know what, that, that's, that wasn't a good thing. That was, he was scolding him. It was pride. He was saying, I want, I want to be God. I don't want to be like God. He could have been like God. I don't want to be like God. I want to be God. How do I know it? Romans of four, uh, Matthew four ten when he when he attacked Jesus Christ as Jesus opened up his earthly ministry the first thing he did he was attacked him and one of the things he said I'll give you listen you've come here to get your kingdom <laughs> not yet He said, if you, I will give you the kingdoms, you don't have to go to the cross. I'll give you the kingdom without the cross. God says you got to go to the cross to get the kingdom. That's the millennial age. you got to go to the cross to get the kingdom, my dear son. Yes, sir. Devil comes along and says, you don't have to go to the cross to get them. Listen, I'll give them to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. Could he, could he do that? No, because he's a what? Please tell me you know what he is. Because he's a liar. And he deceives you with lies. He's a liar. Liar, liar. Pants on fire. Can you not forget? Listen to Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Boy, those go together. Pride and a haughty spirit. And boy, when you see it, it irritates you. You go like, ah. and it should, because it's part of the angelic conflict. The fall of the fall of Adam. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you will die. Die and you will die. Did he eat? <laughs> Did he die? Oh yeah. Because God's true to his word. And what did God tell him in Genesis 2.17? <laughs> Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> in the very day that you eat from it, what? Dying you will die, is what it says in Hebrew. I'll show it to you when we get there next year. Genesis 2, 17. That's how you get Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so that death sin spread to all mankind. That's why you need Christ. You die in that sin death, you're going to wind up the same place the devil's going to wind up, and that's lake fire. Oh, we're in Genesis. You just go ahead and read Revelation 20. It's a powerful idea. Watch this, though. Eve, she, Eve, took from its fruit, tree of knowledge of good and evil, and ate. And then she gave it also to her husband, and he ate. Listen to what Paul wrote about that in 2 Corinthians 11.3. I am afraid for you, Paul wrote to the church, Least as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftsmanship, that schemes, your minds, your minds, you know, it's a terrible thing to waste, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. As the serpent deceived Eve, where did he get her? Where did he get her? What was his target, and did he hit his target? Her mind, and did he get it? So what do you think it is for you? Da -da 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 -da. Jesus made an important connection to the fall of Satan in the angelic conflict to his earthly ministry when he encountered a guy called Legends, uh, Legions, a uh, well worth your time. We were talking about, at least I was the other day, just how big is Legion? 
And I said there was a lot, there's a lot of debate about it. In the story, however, how many was it? Because the demons that were in one man, the demons that were in one man went into all, how many pigs? Do you, do you remember the story? Now we're guessing now, right? But we don't have to guess because it's in the Bible. We don't have to guess when it's in the Bible. You only have to guess when it's not in the Bible, right? This is in the Bible and kind of answers that question. Well, you think I'm going to tell you, and I'm not. <laughs> uh, there's some things you've got to do on your own, people. You need to go to the spiritual gym and lift a little weights here. It's interesting, though, for me. Well, I've got, I've, I'm out of time today. If you'll go ahead and read the rest of this, because listen, what happened to Eve and what happened to Adam is really interesting, because listen, li listen, you're, look, on your papers before you leave, and I'll let you go if you'll do one more thing for me. I'm going to let you go anyhow, but I'd like one thing. I'd like one thing in here where it says, see, uh, um, in about the middle of the second paper, it says, it is interesting that Paul said that Eve fell into the transgression of Adam. Whoa, 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 whoa. See, you missed that one. 